Is it possible that we are going into a stagflationary recession? And what does this have to do with potentially looking back at the 1970s? Well, let's talk about exactly that. So in the 1970s, we had the Arab oil embargo, which created a prolonged period of inflation, gas lines, gas shortages, gas rationing, and massive inflation. Massive to the point where we had to get what's now called Volckerd, which is when Paul Volcker stepped in finally in the late 70s and early 80s and said, enough of this, we're raising rates aggressively to over 15, 16%, so we can crush inflation by getting ahead of inflation. We are going to force a recession because when we raise rates so substantially, we sap demand, creating a year-over-year -year negative growth in GDP, two quarters of that in a row, boom, you've got a recession. So we crushed it uh, essentially by raising rates to such ridiculous levels that borrowing essentially stopped and we were able to end inflation by proving that the Federal Reserve had the intention of fighting inflation. See, back in the 70s, at the same time as we had the Arab oil embargo, we had a complete loss of confidence in the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve just hadn't had to deal with this before and they were clueless in terms of how to deal with it. The government was failing because the government had price ceiling policies in place, which just exacerbated shortages. I mean, think about it. If prices are not allowed to go up, then you get even more shortages, which eventually bottles up even more inflation. And so when those price ceiling policies were removed uh, in the 70s uh, by Nixon, what did you end up having? Well, you ended up having substantial inflation because the price ceiling is now gone. And so prices were able to go to market prices, which were now exacerbated by even worse shortages, right? And so inflation took hold via the uh, Arab oil embargo, these lifting of failed government uh, uh, policies on price ceilings, uh, and the expectation that the Federal Reserve was not going to be able to tame inflation. That was really bad. And on top of that, what did we do in the 70s? Well, Nixon in 1971 decided, you know what, we're gonna leave the gold standard, which made everybody think that's it, we're going back to the 1920s, Weimar Republic, where you're walking around with wheelbarrows of cash in, uh, because, well, like a loaf of bread costs a wheelbarrow of cash. Uh, and, and so this, this led to the expectation that that inflation was just going to destroy the American dollar, especially since it wasn't on the gold standard and either we'd go back in the gold standard or we're screwed. Now we ended up just getting Volckert, which was also bad because it led to a pretty nasty recession, uh, but, but it ended up solving inflation. And, and so this is how we ended up regaining uh, fiat trust, so to speak, and inflation stabilized. And so for 40 years thereafter, inflation has been essentially on, on this downward trend that, uh, you know, productivity is up, uh, you've got uh, innovation up, and, and really expectations that uh, over time as democracies mature, you end up getting less inflation. That's just statistically what happens. And this is why uh, more mature democracies like you have uh, in Europe are substantially, uh, or, or, or before this latest crisis, have been facing substantially lower inflation than us, uh, even to the point of being in a territory where uh, rates are negative, right? This is not where, the Amer where America was before. Uh, the pandemic and war. And so that's where we now have this boom of inflation now. And it is the largest commodity shock that we've really experienced since the 1970s. Uh, and so it's scary because much like the shock of the Arab oil embargo in the 70s, we've got this dual effect now of a pandemic via COVID 1.0, uh, Delta variant of COVID, Omicron variant of COVID, and now war, all leading to a similar style energy and commodity shock, again, the likes of which we haven't seen for 50 plus years. And this could get even worse by the halting of natural gas flows from Russia to Germany and other countries who refuse to use the Russian ruble to transact because this would require Germany essentially have a bank in Russia and uh, send euros to that bank in Russia, uh, convert to the Russian ruble and, and then buy uh, you know, natural gas. Poland has so far refused to do this and has been cut off by Russia. And, and so you, you get a lot of these sort of fears th that are building up. Uh, and on top of that, we now had the first quarter of negative GDP for the United States, uh, you know, since the COVID pandemic. This was absolutely not expected. Nobody was forecasting uh, this, well, at least in, in terms of uh, economist consensus estimates of uh, growth of 1.4%, you know, us actually, I think it was actually growth of 1.5%, but actually having GDP of negative 1.4%, we got some real issues, right? On top of the fact that China's already likely in a recession, but their, their data is questionable, so, you know, 
maybe they are in a recession, but we don't know about it. Uh, South Korea has had uh, its highest levels of inflation in the last 10 years. We don't even need to start talking about the inflation that we're seeing in Brazil, over 10%, Argentina, even more than that. Uh, Europe's likely in a recession or going into a recession. Global growth is slowing. And quite frankly, we expect GDP this year uh, to be 4.1% across the world, or we, at least I should say we expected that in January. And that's already been cut by like 25% down to 3.3%. And quite frankly, it, that's likely still too high. We're probably going to have even lower global growth. Uh, at the same time, we started the year with global inflation expectations of around 2.25% for the world, and we're going to be at like 6.2%. That's at least where the estimates are now, which are also probably wrong. <laughs> so this is where now there are serious concerns that we're going to be in a stagflationary environment, potentially all of 2022. And so stagflation is really like the worst possible case that you could imagine, because if you're in stagflation and you're maybe in a stagflation induced recession, so we could call that stagflationary recession. Well, now you've got really big problems because see, the way you solve stagflation is by on one hand, you have to deal with part one, which is a stagnating economy. Well, usually but the way to solve a stagnating economy is you expect productivity to go up and spending to go up. But uh, the way to encourage that would be via stimulus or lower interest rates. But the way, uh, if you do that, you actually end up likely increasing the odds of inflation continuing and, and anchoring. And if inflation gets anchored because people are seeing, wow, the Fed's still printing money, wow, the U.S. government is, is, is you know still printing money, well, then what do you have? Well, you end up, and I just want to clarify that really quick so I don't get comments on it. The, the United States government, actually runs the money printers, but the Federal Reserve can essentially finance that by creating numbers on a spreadsheet, okay? They call it digital printing. The government actually prints it, okay? Government stimulates via like stimulus checks. Uh, the Federal Reserve stimulates by lowering rates or you know buying bonds, uh, which, which then puts cash on bank balance sheets, which they can then lend out, okay? Clarify. So anyway, uh, so the way you deal with inflation is by raising rates. And again, the way you deal with stagnation is by lowering rates. So you're really at like, uh, like what? What is the Federal Reserve supposed to do? And remember, consumers make up 70% of the economy. So this means, honestly, 2022, and we've been saying this since January, and I've had this consistent argument that 2022 could just straight up suck. Why? Because here's the thing. Q1 GDP was negative. Well, what happens if Q1 GDP being negative is enough to kind of uh, create enough fear in, in at least some consumers that we pull back, not like substantially, but just to where we're, we, we're not positive year over year. Like if GDP, just for simple purposes, is $20 trillion last year, and then this year we pull back just $1, just $1. Like you don't actually have to pull back that freaking much. You just pull back $1. Now you're negative year over year, right? At 19.99, whatever. Uh, so uh, this means we could actually have a stagflationary recession to where now some folks are saying, look, we might be negative for Q1 because we had Omicron in January and people weren't spending in January. People are spending more now, uh, which means maybe we'll have a positive Q2. But if people get scared about what happened in Q1, and then we get worse spending in Q3 and 4, especially since Q3, 4 last year is when we had the child tax credit, lots of spending, the like crazy Black Friday numbers, right? Lots of consumer spending. Well, then we could end up having a negative Q1, negative Q3, negative Q4. And even though we technically didn't have a recession in the first half, we would have a recession in the second half. And you could just have a nasty 2022, which would probably set up for an easy beat in 2023, which means no recession in 2023. But still, you're going to live through potentially this stagflationary recession of 2022, where the only way to get through this nonsense is basically just to suffer. You're going to suffer the stock market volatility. You suffer the real estate volatility because as the 10-year treasury is dancing around 3% mortgage rates, people are now getting quoted. I mean, they're technically sitting around five, five and a quarter, but unless you're a perfect borrower, you're probably paying like, 5.58s right now for, for a loan, uh, which is crazy. I mean, we're, we're closer to 6% now than we are to 5%. So uh, in other words, we, we could see that spending decline and then end up having a stagflationary recession towards, towards the end of the year. Now, the only thing that could potentially make this better is potentially hitting peak inflation and us being at a, uh, a point where the Federal Reserve can U-turn. And so this is the hopium that everybody has. It's kind of like why my coupon code linked down below for the programs on building your wealth in real estate and stocks is back to the moon. Because if it comes true that we do end up having peak inflation in March, then the Federal Reserve can actually deal with stagflation. 
they could say, okay, cool. We don't actually have to raise rates as aggressively. So we could keep like, stay at neutral or slightly kind of stimulate the markets to avoid, well, not markets, the economy, to, uh, to prevent stagflation, while at the same time, inflation is naturally coming down. That would just be like best case scenario, but it could be just like, you know, smoke and hopium. So uh, forecasts right now actually kind of suggest that the hopium might be accurate. Uh, and so that's what's also weird is, first of all, five-year break-evens, which are the market's expectations for inflation, have come down since their peak in March quite substantially. The peak in March, we were at like 3.7% on the five-year break-even. Now we're at 3.23%. Uh, so that's a nice decline. The uh, forecast for inflation next month is 0.2% month over month. That's an annualized run rate of inflation of just 2.4%. That's really, really good. Uh, core inflation is expected to be 0.4%, which is an annual run rate of about 4.8%. That excludes food and gas, which in order for you to have a higher core number than a higher overall number means that food and gas went negative, which is entirely possible that food and gas went negative because uh, in, you know, in April compared to March, because in March, everything just went to the freaking moon. You know, at the same time, we have, uh, you know, some signs that, that consumers are relaxing a little bit, uh, you know, with, with their spending, which is actually a good thing. For example, leading indicators of rail car freight activity are showing somewhat of a slowdown in consumer spending for crap, for goods and services, uh, certainly durables, used car prices going down, uh, washing machines, refrigerators, right? These things relaxing. Uh, however, service spending is still crazy. I mean, you look at uh, uh, the travel sector and forecasts for like Expedia and forecasts for, for the airlines. Those are actually really good. So consumer still spending, but spending in places where we're not doubling up on those supply chain issues. So potentially we end up with a peak in March, right? Uh, and so then when you kind of look at what the stock market is doing, and this is, uh, in my opinion, quite interesting, it's, it's sort of a little bit of a leading indicator that maybe the inflationary fear play is starting to unwind a little bit. And remember, I don't know if this is going to be a fact, but I always like to tell you things when I see them happen uh, earlier. So, so that way you can have a little bit of a, of a heads up uh, in, in terms of where a trend might be going. So remember when we had inflationary concerns, it was like, okay, get out of consumer discretionaries, get into consumer staples and materials. So what did everybody do? Everybody flocked to things like Costco, which is your like core consumer staple. Okay, fine. But what happened with Costco? Well, Costco is now actually trending down. It's down like what? 12% now from its peak just about a week to two weeks ago. Uh, another one, MP Materials was, a mi you know, it, it is still a mining company, but it was seen as, oh my gosh, this is the perfect hedge for inflation. It's been on this phenomenal uptrend, but you've seen this peak right around the beginning of April. And so it's kind of been on like a one month downtrend. I mean, so has the NASDAQ, right? The NASDAQ's also been on a one month downtrend, but you are seeing some potential capping at some of these. Same thing with the weed ETF, even though it's been consolidating on slightly a little upward trend, uh, it certainly hasn't been at some of the peaks that we've seen. Now, again, it could be that this is correlating to the NASDAQ uh, or the SPY going down, but Costco has been going up regularly during times in which the SPY has been going down. Again, you go back to Costco. It's really been just recent. Let's go to the day here instead of the week. It's really only been since about the last week of April that you've seen this sort of peaking and U-turning here. So this is something where some folks are saying, hey, the market, Kevin, is already telling us that we're, we've hit peak fear in commodities. We've hit peak fear in inflation protections. Market expectations via the five-year break even are way down from, uh, you know, down 60 basis points uh, from, from where we were in March. Uh, and consumer expectations of inflation are actually stable. Uh, and then this is where folks also say, hey, look, Kevin, literally, uh, I, you know, I have it right here on the Bloomberg terminal and Reuters terminal. We literally just while I've been yapping here just three minutes ago, got two big updates. We got a beat like a, a, a substantial beat on factory orders up over 2% versus the 1% expected, which is a sign that I don't know. I mean, the consumer still spending, which echoes literally what we're seeing in all of the earnings reports, all of the earnings reports that we're getting, whether it's uh, you, you know, uh, uh, Apple, the chipsets, the airlines, the banks, uh, individual companies, you name it, the consumer spending. Uh, so it doesn't, it, it's not a surprise that we also just got the JOLTS number, which is jobs openings. And uh, we were expecting 11.2 million job openings. We actually got 11.5 million, which means that like businesses aren't really worried about a stagflationary recession uh, because 
job openings are here, you know? Like, layoffs and stuff tend to happen after a recession has started, but, like, job openings are a nice, oftentimes, leading indicator. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, the rest of the year, obviously, will, will really matter in terms of what the Fed does. The Fed is expected not to shock and awe us, but they are expected to front load some, some of their actions. And the hope is, again, this is just a hope, then in order for us to really avoid a very painful stagflationary recession, we need inflation to go down naturally, not to get Paul Volcker, and the Fed to just go back to like neutral or slightly accommodative, uh, but not like super aggressive like we're Paul Volckering, and, uh, and absolutely destroy this economy. Because the Fed could do that. If a Paul Volcker, by the way, would look like this. Inflation's at 8.5%, the Fed goes fine. We'll set rates at 9%. That's a Paul Volkering. Like, people are worried about 50 basis points, and I'm like, this is moronic. Like, who cares? We're at a quarter basis point now for the FOMC. You go up a half percent, we're still at 0.75. Like, come on, man. We need to be above 2% to be above neutral. And we're not even close to where inflation is. So, like, these Fed hikes are super nominal. We're not getting Paul Volkered here. We're just, like slightly turning the hose off a little faster than the market likes. And the market's like, oh, yeah, it's the end of the world. And the way the end of the world, like, actually doesn't happen is the stag, the flation part of stagflation goes away. And we're starting to see signs of that. And so, personally, I'm really optimistic, but that doesn't mean that 2022 is still not going to suck. <laughs> but, again, if I, if I zoom out and I'm like, well, let me look at the history of markets. Where do I want to invest? Do I want to invest when the market's at bottom? Or do I want to invest, you know, when everybody's euphoric and happy? Well, I'd rather invest in a recession. And I think 2022 is actually the year of recession. Whether that's we have a positive and negative first half or, posi or, 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 or I'm sorry, an all negative first half or an all negative second half or, or some combination where it's like it's negative, positive, negative, negative, and then we have a recession at the end. I don't really care. I think it's setting up for low comps for easy beats in 2023 uh, and, and, and then your recessionary fears go away. Uh, that's It's all moved up since the last GDP report, but those, those are just my thoughts. So my thoughts on the stagflationary recession. You want to talk to me in private lives, you can do that as well. Check out the programs I'm building your wealth link down below, especially the real estate ones. Okay, so that's my talk on stagflationary recession.